Good evening and welcome everybody to Our Energy Future, a series of lectures over the next 22 days, 12 lectures that are going to explore everything about our, our energy future. Tonight we have three speakers, uh, all scientists, who are going to give their individual opinions on our energy future. Over the next 22 days we'll have policy makers, economists, international relations experts, and probably some more scientists and climatologists to add their perspectives on our energy future. As mentioned in your program, you have the opportunity to ask questions of any and all of these speakers via Google, Facebook, and Twitter. And these 12 lectures, along with your questions and the answers, are being recorded thanks to our sponsor, Google. And let me acknowledge our other sponsor, Rubio's. In my opinion, our energy future is bright, but not assured or automatic. Both in San Diego and especially on our UCSD campus, we are off to a successful start. But it will take all of our innovation skills and dedication to continue to move forward. Why do I say that we're off to a successful start? Well, every day, or almost every day, our local utility delivers electricity to all of its customers, and about a third of it is from rene renewable resources. That's day in, day out. I heard an anecdotal statement a couple of days ago from a usually reliable source who's a little shy and very cautious, so he or she's not willing to go on the record. But it's someone I trust, and I was told on one particular hour last month, our local utility supplied energy, of which 60% was from renewable resources. To me, that's very, very encouraging, because I think we're only just getting started. I think we've barely begun to capitalize on yesterday's advances, let alone the technologies of today and the future innovations you're going to hear about in these 12 lectures. On this UC San Diego campus, we've been able to go further, starting more than a decade ago with the wise investment in a cogeneration facility, progressing all the way to today's advanced microgrid and use of renewable resources this campus is running the most advanced energy distribution system on any campus, anywhere. And to the overnight thermal energy storage system, which uses chilled water, that's operational right now, the campus will soon be adding a two-hour electrical storage mechanism, all coupled, of course, to the advanced microgrid. As they say, the better the microgrid, the less storage you need. I think for the, San, for the San Diego community, five years ago, the idea that the San Onofre nuclear power plant with its base load electricity provision, the idea that that source could go offline permanently was a nightmare concept. But thanks to some good planning, like the Sunrise Power Link, and some fortuitous timing, the actuality of that resource going offline permanently is just another energy problem that we have to solve and learn from. So before we have our first speaker tonight, to give the official welcome, I'd like to bring to the stage the UC San Diego Chancellor, Pradeep Khosla. Pradeep. Does this work? Thanks, Tony. Uh, oh, I guess this works, not this. Uh, thanks, Tony, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's indeed a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I say a few words, uh, let me tell you, Tony is one of our most ardent supporters of energy. He was one of the instigators uh, behind the creation of Clean Tech uh, San Diego, uh, which is an amazing organization focused on energy out here. So it's very appropriate that Tony be here this morning. Uh, well, I'm the warm-up act, 
I'm the warm-up act in the sense that I'm supposed to make you laugh or say a few jokes or something so that the three superstar faculty members, including one dean who happens to be a faculty member too on the side, are the ones who are going to keep you, uh, get your imagination going out here. Uh, let me say a little bit about why I think that this topic is really important. If you think about the world right now, I think there are three problems we face which are each one in its own right is very complex, and the three are coupled in a very complex way on top of it, and that is food, fuel, and water. And energy is the fuel part of it, and energy is the source. Energy is the thing that drives economic wealth. It drives, it drives the economy, it drives our ability to feed people. It drives just about everything we do. And as we think about a world that is looking for a better quality of life, the U.S. over the last 100 years has achieved that. But as we think about India, China, Indonesia, Philippines, Africa looking for a better quality of life, their energy needs are growing way faster than the American or the U.S. energy needs. And this is when the problem starts, where the amount of CO2 the, uh, we're going to dump into the, uh, into the atmosphere is going to be such that it's going to change the global balance uh, of uh, the, global the global climate that uh, we are in right now. And that's what makes the problem complex. So you might say, where does water come in? If you look at water, in the, it take, takes a lot of water to create energy. So energy cannot be created without water. Um, fresh water is one of the rare consumables in this uh, world that the water tables across the world are falling, are falling. And I think we need to be very careful about it. And these are problems that are not taught in any discipline. Chemistry by itself does not, cannot solve the water problem. Engineering by itself cannot solve the energy problem. Uh, physics by itself cannot solve the food problem. These are problems that where multiple disciplines come together to address this issue. And I think there is no better place than UC San Diego. Uh, and during the course of this quarter, you will see that this experiment that uh, is the brainchild of uh, Steve Mayfield, I think, uh, which got triggered by a grant from Google. So this is actually a MOOC. So you're sitting right now in what is called a MOOC, a massive online uh, open course. And you are part of a class. You may not know it. Some of you are being graded, others not. And it, I'm not kidding you, it's your choice. If you're taking this course for credit, then you're gonna be graded. If you're not taking it for credit, uh, then you are the open public. And I think uh, this is an amazing concept. I'm so glad that we are doing it out here. Tonight, this evening, you're gonna hear from three of our faculty, all superstars, during the course of this quarter, you're gonna have 12 such lectures from 40 such people in all throughout UC San Diego talking about uh, the work we are doing in the smart grid, in uh, micro uh, grids, in fuel cells, in biotechnology, and I can just go down the list. But all of this got initiated about a few years ago when our esteemed, my esteemed colleague and our EVC, Suresh Subramani, who's sitting right there, decided that energy was one of the things we're going to be investing in. And he made, uh, Suresh, what, 20 faculty positions? Was it 20? Like two years ago, right? Uh, Suresh invested a lot of money, and I'm so glad he did, because I think we are at the cusp of a transformation, and we at UC San Diego want to be in the leading position, in the lead position, uh, to make that happen. So with that said, uh, I'm just going to introduce to you Steve Mayfield. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Or, or you, look, I'll give you back to Dr. Tony Heyman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Heyman. I'm a professor of oceanography here at UC San Diego, former director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and as uh, the Chancellor mentioned, co-founder of Cleantech, Cleantech San Diego. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, without whom many things on this campus wouldn't happen, all, all good things, I'm glad to say. That's Professor Stephen Mayfield. The title of his talk is going to be Production, and utilization of fossil fuels, consequences, and future prospects. Steve is director of the California Center for Algae Biotechnology and a co-director of the Food and Fuel for the 21st Century Organized Research Unit at UC San Diego. He's also the John Doves Isaacs Chair of Natural Philosophy 
in the Division of Biological Sciences. Some of the highlights of Steer's research are into the molecular genetics of green algae and on the production of high-value recombinant proteins and biofuel molecules using algae as a production platform. Recent studies from his lab have shown the potential of engineering algae for the production of superior biofuel molecules as a source of renewable energy. He's the scientific founder of Sapphire Energy, uh, one of the world's largest companies developing biofuels in algae and photosynthetic bacteria. Let's bring on the stage Professor Stephen Mayfield. Steve. Thank you, Tony. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my job tonight, uh, I, I guess I drew the short straw, right? So even though I'm uh, a, an expert in algal genetics, I'm not going to tell you anything about that. But because this is, as the Chancellor said, a MOOC, a massive online open course, we have to have an introductory talk about energy and its consequences. And I'm particularly, uh, I guess passionate maybe is the word, I don't know, um, annoyed by, by what I read in the newspaper and what I see on TV, and so at least half my talk is going to be to try to, uh, to put in perspective just where we sit in energy today. Do we have a slide changer? Oh, it's here. Okay. All right. So let me start with this. I guess I, we have to start with the basics. It's a, this is an introductory to energy talk, so let's start with the basics. What is energy? Energy is the capacity to do work, okay? And work is force multiplied by distance. So you will all recognize there are lots of different forms of energy. Chemical energy, the most common one you see all the time. This can be gasoline for your car. This can be food. Solar energy, so this drives photosynthesis, but it also drives photovoltaics, right? It keeps us warm. Uh, mechanical energy, this happens to be a ride, but it could be a car. Nuclear energy and electrical power, okay? So all of these are different forms that we commonly see every day, but the most important thing that we have to understand is that the first law of thermodynamics has to be followed. And what that says is energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one state to another. So what does that mean? What that means is that we do not produce energy. Right? We can't make it. What we can do is we can mine it if it's fossil fuel. We can pull that out of the ground. And then we can burn it and we can convert that chemical energy into mechanical energy to drive a car or fly a plane. Okay? We can certainly convert solar energy into food or into electricity, all right? But those energies already exist, right? Where does our energy come from? Surprisingly, most of it comes from fossil fuel, about 85% of it, all right? We do get a fair amount from combustibles, right? This means wood. It also means dung in many parts of the world. You burn that for cooking or burn that to stay warm, right? We get, a, we get some from hydroelectric and a fair amount from nuclear, but clearly most of it comes from these three, right? And these are certainly the things that impact us greatly. And as we'll talk over the next, you know, 12 lectures, over the next four weeks, right, the, you know, the, the mining of these things, the processing and the burning of these things has significant consequences. I'll talk a little bit today about what I think some of the most important consequences are of this, which is actually not in transportation, but it's rather in food, in food production. But next week we'll also talk about the consequences this has on the environment in terms of climate change. And the week after that, we'll talk about the economics of this, right? Because for large parts of the world, the economics of energy are what impacts their lives gravely, all right? And then the very last night, we're going to talk about food and food security and water, right? All right, but here's an important concept that we also have to understand, right? And that is that there's a difference between energy and power. So oil is stored energy. Right? It is potential energy. We can burn that. Power, which is electricity, is produced and delivered for transmission for immediate use. Right? We all obviously understand this. If you go out and have gasoline in your car, you understand that that's energy. And any time you choose to go out and turn that ignition, right? as long as your car's in good shape, it'll start and drive. Right? That is very different than electricity. Electricity, we take fossil fuels primarily, a little bit of wind and solar, but primarily fossil fuel. We turn that into electricity, we put that on the grid, and it has to be used by somebody. If it's not, it simply dissipates as heat. Right? So there's a big difference between these two. Obviously, for transportation, these are wonderful things that we have fuels. All right? 
So they're not completely interchangeable. We think about them as interchangeable, but for many things, they're not. Right? Okay, so why is energy so important? Right? Obviously, we use it in every single thing we do. But for myself, when I really started to, to look at energy about six or seven years ago, I was shocked by some of the numbers on this. All right? Today, energy production in the world is $5.8 trillion, with a T, trillion. All right? As I'll show you in a minute, food and fuel are really just two different parts of chemical energy. In fact, we take a lot of our, our fossil fuel and turn that into food. Chemicals, you'll recognize, clearly come from fossil fuels. So if you add all of these things up together, all of those parts of energy actually equal about 70% of the total commerce on the planet. Just to put that in perspective, here's pharmaceuticals, right? We think of the pharma industry as enormous here in San Diego. It's only about $650 billion total. Now, that's not all medicine. If you add in all medicine, all surgeries, all doctors, or everything else, that number goes up a lot. But if we just talk about the physical properties of it, right, just what is bought and sold in that, it is a fraction of what the world's energy market is. And that world energy market, as the Chancellor said, is growing incredibly fast. Not so much here in North America and not so much in Europe, but in what we call the developing world, in China and India. It's growing much faster than their populations are growing. Why is it growing much faster than that? And why, what, what's another reason that we continue to consume more energy? Is this slide, I think, is very interesting, right? What this plots is gross domestic product per capita. So on average, how much wealth any individual in that country, how much you earn, okay? Against energy consumption per capita. And here we are up here, the United States, the wealthiest country on the planet, and also the largest energy consumer. Now, some countries, like Canada, consume a little more energy than us. It's a little colder up there. Distance is a little longer. You have to drive farther. They also have more energy than we have. So they don't have to quite conserve it as much. And, and their, their GDP isn't quite as high, so they consume a little more energy and a little lower GDP. Here's Japan. They're a little more conservative on their energy than we are. They tend not to drive cars. They live in, in smaller buildings and tighter confines. So, so you can certainly be different places upon this graph, depending upon sort of the efficiency of how you live. But the most important thing is that if you want to increase your gross domestic product, you do that by increasing your energy consumption. So if you're one of the countries down here and you'd like to be one of the countries up there, you do this by increasing energy consumption. So the reason that number is growing so quickly, the reason that number is growing 40% is because those two little dots right there are China and India. 2.5 billion people, one-third of the population on this planet. And they want to live the same way we do. They want to live in a nice house. They want to have a nice car. They want to be able to drive. And in order to do that, they're going to consume the same amount of energy we are. So they're, as their, their, their wealth goes up, their energy consumption is going to go up. So this is going to continue to increase at a very rapid rate. Okay, so we, we, we talk about it, you know, you'll see in the newspapers, oh, we can get electric cars, we can, we can think about different forms of transportation, but why is fossil fuel, why are liquid fuels still so dominant? And why do we still use them? Because they're actually really wonderful things, right? They, they were designed to be fantastic storage of energy. And so, so this is energy density of transportation fuels. And here's gasoline and diesel, this enormous British thermal unit. So this is the energy content per liter is enormous. Here's, uh, here's lithium-ion batteries, okay? That's an electric car. It's not that electric cars don't work. It's that you can only store a very small amount of energy inside those batteries. Some of you know this because if you get a car, you're limited on how far you can drive it before you have to charge it up again. If you, if you have a gas tank full, right, with, with 16 or, tw or, or 20 gallons in it, you can go hundreds and hundreds of miles on this because of this, because the energy density is so high. So they're actually fantastic sources of energy, right? They're, they're a fantastic resource. The other thing is they're actually cheap. So we complain about gasoline. We say, oh, it's $4 a gallon. How can that be? You know, we demand that it only be $2 a gallon. But in fact, we pay outrageous sums of money for other things. I mean, here, I, you know, we, I, I picked Fiji water here at $7.15 a gallon. Lord knows what a Starbucks coffee would be per gallon if I put it up there. Some of those fancy things, I'm sure, are well over 25, right? This, at, at, at 
$4 a gallon is still only 60 cents a pound, right? That's cheaper than potatoes, that's cheaper than rice. That is literally cheaper than anything you can get on the planet except dirt, right? The other thing that this enormous energy density, so one gallon of gasoline has 116,000 BTUs. That is equivalent to about 108 slices of pizza, right? So if you had to go out and buy the same number of calories as in a gallon of gasoline, it would cost you about 217 bucks. This is why fossil fuels are still used. This is why they're still going to be used in the future, right? Because there is still a fair amount on this planet. Although we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, there's not quite as much as maybe you've heard recently. So today, in the United States, we consume about 300 billion gallons of fuel every year. About 19, sorry, about 19 million barrels a day. This is, this is total consumption of the world over the last 25 years. Right, today we're just a little bit under 90 million barrels per day of energy consumption. And what you can see is by and large, these countries here, which is Asia and Pacific, they're going up pretty quick. Many of you may know that in North America and Europe, we've actually declined over the last four or five years in our energy, in our, in our petroleum use, mainly because we've gotten more efficient in our automobiles, something called the CAFE standards. It was a requirement that cars become more fuel efficient. We've also become more clever about insulating our houses and getting more fuel efficient in our buildings. All right? But we already live at a very high standard of living, so we can afford those efficiency increases. These guys don't live at a high standard of living. This is, this is by and large, this increase is electrification in India and China. This is the power plants that are going into India and China so that they can have electricity, so that they can read at night and maybe air condition their buildings. All right? So this number is going to continue to go up. Here's just one really good example of it. This is actually a picture from the freeways in Beijing in 2009. And I had been there 10 years previous to this. And at that time, there was a huge number of bicycles and mopeds just everywhere. They just dominated the streets. And when I went back in 2009, this is what it looked like. All the motorcycles and mopeds were gone. And they had been replaced by these brand new cars. Maybe it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but all of the cars are brand new. And in fact, in 2010, 11 million new cars were sold into China, about the same number that were sold into the United States. Although in the United States, that's about a steady state. We retire about 19 million cars per year, and we put about 19 million new ones on the road. In China, these are all new cars. So this is simply a plot of the number of automobiles that are coming. Here's the increase in the world. Here's US where it's steady state. In 2011, worldwide number of cars surpassed 1 billion automobiles. And this number is going to continue to go up. So th this brings up a theory of, of you know, peak oil. Well, it's a limited resource. We're eventually going to run out of this, right? So the theory of peak oil came about back in the 1950s from a guy named M. King Huber, who predicted statistically that the United States would hit peak oil sometime around 1970. He predicted this way back here in 1956. He predicted that we would hit peak oil something in 1970, and that we would hit that at about 10 million barrels per day. And that's exactly what we came. We came up to just under 10 million barrels per day in 1970, and then that, that trail started down. Two important events happened. One was the Arab oil embargo in the mid-70s. That spiked the price of oil, right? Started us looking for new sources of it. We found that the, the North Shore of Alaska, Prudhoe Bay, that increased it for a while, then it went back again. The other really significant event came about in 2007. In 2007, the price of oil briefly spiked to $150 a barrel, and it's seldomly gone below $100 a barrel since then. That allowed this technology called fracking to take off, right? It's not new technology, it's 50-year-old technology. What allowed it to, to, to be successful the way you see it today is that $100 a barrel, you can afford to do it, right? But that's not going to go on forever, and I'll show you a little bit of evidence about that, okay? But what I see in the papers and what I'm really quite curious about is this idea that, that people have put out that fracking is somehow going to make us energy independent again. In fact, I, I saw one prediction from this guy right here, Mark Perry. So he's an economist 
at, at the University of Michigan, and he's also part of the American Enterprise Institute. And then here's another guy, Arthur Berman, who happens to be a, a petroleum geologist. And so here's two guys who took the exact same data, right? The, the source, you know, the Energy Information Administration. So that's the Department of Energy's, you know, factual. These are, these are things. So, so, so he took this, and here's his plot of this. So here's Mark Perry's plot of this, right? And what he plotted was petroleum production, the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Europe, okay? And what he shows here is that, oh, Europe's on its way down, and here's Saudi Arabia, and here's the United States, okay? And we passed Saudi Arabia, right? So this is the guy who said, based upon this projection, I'm going to project that we're going to be energy independent, and we'll be exporting oil by 2018, right, in five years. And this got picked up by the press. Now, people instantly came out and said, hey, wait a minute. You have us up here at 12 million barrels per day. And our real number is about 6.4. Well, how did you get this? Well, his petroleum turned out to count every single liquid fuel we made, including the 13.9 billion gallons of corn ethanol. He just added that in, too. And he added liquid fuels from fracking gas and everything he could find. Right? So you, you can say, well, he skewed it. But, but at any rate, he, he projected this. And people said, oh, that's fantastic. We're going to have oil that's going to go on forever. But here's, really, here's our real production, right? Here's how much petroleum we really produce. And yes, fracking has increased it up to there. But here's our consumption. We're still off by 9 million barrels per day, right? with no possibility to get there. And the Department of Energy doesn't think we're going to get there. Here's their projections. Here's consumption. Here's production. They say in 2035, we're still going to have a gap of 36%. But the one good news is that they also projected here, what's our energy use per capita? So here's our energy efficiency in 2005 dollars. It's gone down since 1980, which means we're getting much more efficient at using energy. And here's our actual energy use per capita. It started to go down in 2010, mainly because the price of oil got so high, we decided to become more efficient. Okay. But here's why fracking isn't going to last forever and why it is certainly not going to give us energy independence. So this is the average production from shale gas well, right? This happens to be fracking gas wells, and these things drop so that they are only productive for about three years, right? So this enormous bolus of natural gas that we have now will be gone in the next two years. And the price of natural gas will go back up again to 7 or $8 a million BTU, and then we'll start fracking again. We're not fracking for this now. We've changed fracking to oil because the price of oil is $106, $103 a barrel today. But the overall field production, here's fracking wells and oil wells, and this is a very interesting analysis that, that this guy right here, J. David Baker, did. What he did was he said, well, the problem is that the number of wells that are going in is going in exponential. We spent last year $186 billion in oil exploration in the United States, the largest number by $25 billion in our history. Okay? We did that because oil is $107 a barrel. So it's very difficult when you're putting on an enormous number of new wells to tell how long they really last. So what he did was he simply picked a point, the end of 2011, and he said every well that has been drilled to that point, I'm just going to keep that stable. I'm not going to count all the new ones, and then I'm going to count productivity coming out of those existing wells. And that's how fast the productivity drops. That tells you what fracking gives you is a two or three year timeline on a well. A traditional well lasts 20 years. That's why there's no possibility that fracking is going to save us. But this is the picture that just amazes me, okay? This is a picture of North America at night. And I think all of you will recognize, oh, here's New York, here's Dallas, here's Los Angeles and San Diego, San Francisco. What is that, right? That is North Dakota, okay? Here's another one right down here, right? That, that's the Eagleford Shale. So what are those? Here's a close-up of that. These are the number of wells drilled in the North Dakota Bakken Shale, okay? What these are is this is the gas that is being flared off those at night, all right? Now, some people view this and say, what a great thing. America is solving their energy problem by drilling thousands of wells. Personally, I think what this tells you is this is a serious addiction, right? This isn't, this isn't Charlie Sheen addiction. This is Lindsay Lohan addiction. This is the kind of addiction where we need intervention. Okay? So here's, our, here's the actual increase. So how much did we really increase? So what did all this really do for us, right? So in 2010, we had a stores of about 25.2 billion barrels. 
extensions, that's how much you get to expand it because the price has gone up so you can do more expensive drilling. That's what really came up. New field discoveries, almost nothing. Here's how much we actually use. So the net gain of that was about 3.8 billion barrels. That's pretty good. 3.8 billion barrels, why we have 29 billion barrels, that's enormous. That must last us for about four years. We consume seven billion barrels of petroleum per year. All of fracking gained us about seven months of oil reserve. Okay, so here's just another way to look at that. This is, this is our oil production over the last 10,000 years. And what this really should say is this is cheap oil production over the last 10,000 years, right? Because at $107 a barrel, you no longer have cheap oil. So that number actually is, is, is our production of that is down to zero. But let me just finish with a couple of different thoughts because our problem is not $4 a gallon gasoline. Our problem is that when we think about energy, we need to think about food. These things are interchangeable, right? They're interchangeable because we take about 40% of our corn crop and we turn that into ethanol and we blend that with gasoline, okay? But we also take petroleum and we turn that back into food. We mainly do that by photosynthesis, okay? We do that by agriculture. It takes an enormous amount of energy to run agriculture, right? As I said, we can turn some of our corn into ethanol. We blend that with our cars. But in fact, both of these things are just two different forms of chemical energy, all right? So why is that, why is that a problem? That, that, that's a problem because we've had enormous increases in yield over the last 50 years, brought about by industrial agriculture. But how did we achieve those? We didn't achieve those by increasing the number of farmers or the amount of land we used for farming. We did that by the number of tractors, by the amount of fertilizer and the amount of energy we put in. So fossil fuel, what we did was we put in enormous amounts of fossil fuel. We had enormous increases in yield. Here's the increase in yield. This happens to be wheat in India from 1960 to 2009, but this would have been true for any of the crops we looked at. Enormous increases in yield, all right? but enormous increases in yield that came at a price of enormous increase in energy. And in fact, if you plot the two, so world food prices, so here is the average oil price in red, here's the average food price in blue, and you can see they track one on top of another. So why that's a problem is this right here. So what this is is that same slide now of cheap oil production, and overlaid on top of that is world population. Right? That's in the red, and here we are right here. So what we did was we took cheap, inexpensive fossil fuel, we turned that into cheap food, and that allowed our population to go above 7 billion people. So the problem now is, what do you do when you have $100 a barrel oil, because now you no longer have cheap food, all right? And we are actually seeing those problems today. This is not some abstract thing that is gonna happen in the future. This is what the Arab Spring is. What the Arab Spring is, it morphed into a democracy riot, but it started as food riots. Because when you have $100 a barrel oil, you have $12 a bushel wheat. And when you have $12 a bushel wheat, about 2.5 billion people on the planet barely get by. 1 billion people no longer get by. So this is the real issue in energy. How on earth can we get food back to being affordable for that bottom billion people, right? And that's what we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. We're going to talk, certainly we're going to talk about the environmental consequences of this, but we're also going to talk about the economics and the sustainability of this. Because this is really the problem we have to address. How do we have a limited resource like energy, whether that's fossil fuel, whether it's sustainable energy, how do we equitably distribute those throughout the planet? That, that is the real challenge that we face. We'll actually do fine in this country. We can afford $4 a gallon gasoline. We could afford $6 a gallon gasoline. And we could probably afford $14 a bushel wheat, but large parts of the world can't, okay? So I'm gonna leave you though with one optimistic thing, and then I'm gonna let the next two scientists tell you about many opportunities we have. But here's the last good news, okay? The world consumes 16 terawatts of energy every year. Today, 85% of that comes from fossil fuel. The good news is that the sun provides 86,000 terawatts of energy every year. So 6,000 times the amount of energy that we need to run the planet for all food, for all transportation, for all water pumping, for all of that, 6,000 times that amount of energy comes from the sun. So we simply have to figure out the way 
that we take that form of energy, and we don't disobey the laws of thermodynamics, but convert that into the forms of energy we need, which are food and transportation fuel, fuels and electricity. And I will end it right there, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Steve. That's on, it? Now, if you have questions from the first talk, at the back of your program is indicated the three ways that you can submit your question. And uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to hear the answer at the conclusion of all three talks. It's time now to introduce our second speaker, Professor Mark Themans. The title of his talk is Future Energy Needs and Consequences from a Physical Science Perspective. Mark is Dean of the UC San Diego Division of Physical Sciences and a distinguished professor of chemistry and biochemistry. Mark. Thank you, Tony. Steve asked me to give a talk on, on energy some months ago, and, and without thinking, I said, yeah, sure, whatever. And so here we are tonight. And, and so full, here's full disclosure. When somebody says to talk about energy and, and whatnot, I sort here's my normal perspective on this, is here. I'm a climate person, and so this is me, what I would normally do, which is look at the consequences of energy. So what I decided to do in this is take a, a different shot at the energy, and what can we do at the forefront of science, which is where my division is, and cure the some of the problems. Where's the limit? That's, that's basically what I did, is where are the limits in this whole problem, and where is it in the science part of it? I'm ignoring everything else because I know nothing else, nothing about those other parts, so I'm just going to focus on this part of it. Where's the limits in science? So it's going to go through some topics that are, I'm not going to go into details about it, you'll be sorry to know there's no equations involved in this, there'll be a couple figures, but I just want to say, here's where the limits are and here's where the research is and I've picked the brains of my colleagues. I've also got some references. This is a, a great book put out by the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council. You can get these things online and there's a lot of great information in this. But I've also picked the brains of my colleagues quite a bit and I'll reference them as they go along because it really helped me quite a bit. Now this you just heard from Steve, this is sort of on this side is what we need. This is the energy, this is where it comes from. There's your oil that he mentioned, the biomass, coal, natural gas, geothermal, and all the others. Comes in from people, we mostly use it for electricity, and it's spread out between residential, commercial, industrial, and of course, the big one is transportation. So what do we do to break this down that it's not so bad? What can we, where, where do we need to learn a little bit more? All right, Steve's mentioned this. We've got the sun, you've got an hour, the way I look at it, you've, in one hour, you have enough sunlight to meet all your energy demands for a year of people. All right, that's not bad. That's easy to say. This is all right, that's no big deal. We'll just go out and get it. You know, you imagine all the people going out with nets and whatever, and <laughs> grabbing it. But, but the problem is actually doing it, and you all know this. You know the problems with solar energy, and, and the biggest problem is this one. You gotta not only capture it, which is photovoltaics, but you gotta store it. You need to have it like Netflix. You need energy on demand. Because if you generate a geothermal or nuclear or whatever, it's pumped out and you use it and you can run it through the grid, but you need to be able to store it. So how do you do that part of it? And that's in this. This is what I got from my, my colleague Cliff Kubiak, who does this for a living. He's, he's, the, he's the master at doing this, and it's basically the trick of the plant. It's artificial photosynthesis. You have to take your, you want to get rid of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so if you can get rid of it, that's good. You want to use sunlight because that's the whole deal here. And then you want to convert it into a, some, something to store it. Plant stores the energy as a fuel, right? That's what Steve was talking about. That's what you got to do, store it. So fuels are how you store it or in some sort of compound that's stable and not a greenhouse gas and isn't toxic. But the problem is getting that sunlight in there and it's a problem of catalysis. You have to make it go. The plants put a lot of energy into doing what they did and you gotta put that much in to get it out just to break even. So that's the chemical part of it. 
And this is essentially what I said. The plants bring in the water, they bring in the carbon dioxide. You all learned this a long time ago. It processes it in this, inside this membrane. But the trick is in doing it is that you gotta do it energy efficiently, which is a catalysis, same sort of catalyst that work in the polar vortex and inside of plants. It makes it go fast and robust and energy efficient. Those are the tricks. So you can do it artificially. You can take CO2 and water and split it apart. The problem is you need a catalyst and it has to go fast because it's something like it's coming in like a fire hose and you're sitting there the size of a little tree frog or something and you're trying to process all this water and you can't. So you gotta be fast and that's the trick and energy efficient. And you also wanna be better than the plants because the plants die or somebody picks them and eats them, whatever. So you have to solve that part of the problem too. So that, in a nutshell, is what you're working at. So from his end, I'm sorry, it's equation, but the, the point that I want to make here is that it's this turnover factor. It's how fast the catalyst goes. That's the trick. Well, how fast is it? It sounds like Johnny Carson. So Ed McMahon should have asked me that. So how fast does it have to go? And the answer is if you take, if you take a normal radio shack photovoltaic cell, and how fast, how much current can it receive? How fast do you have to convert that? All right, how fast does your enzyme then have to turn it over? And the answer is about 100,000 times a second is what you're up against. You've got to turn over that much of the light to be able to use it. It's fast. So what do plants do? They've been at this for about three billion years. It depends on which plants you mean, but somewhere between 3.8 and, and now, billion years ago, they've been doing it. So they've got it wired. So these are a couple of bacteria, one anaerobic and, and one, and they go, the anaerobic guy goes at 31,000 times a second. It's fast. This guy's going at 107 times a second, and here's the trick, without going into the chemistry, Sitting in the middle of these guys um, are catalysts. In this case, it's molybdenum. And in this case, there's, there's iron sitting in here, along with some other catalytic sites. But that's what makes it go. The trick is the recipe. You got to figure out what makes it go. And it has to do with the way the three dimensions and the satellites of these, these electrons. It's you got to get everything lined up right. And the energy has to be right, so it's fast and energy efficient. So can you even think about doing this? And that's the trick. And so the answer is, yeah, this is, this is one where basically this picture on the right, what it is is one of these enzymes. In the middle of it is one of these metals. It's tungsten in this case. And now what they've done is rooted it on an electrode. This is an important trick. So you get two things here. Number, oops, sorry, that's how good it is. So the number one, this actually turns over 282 times a second. That's pretty good. That's fast. Number two, you can put it on an electrode. Because remember, the name of this game is not the turnover factor, unless you're a catalytic chemist, and that's what all the deal is about. But you want to generate electrons out of it. You want to get a flow of current so that you can split water and carbon dioxide. That's the game plan. So it goes quick enough. The only problem with it right now, so this is the state of the art, is that you gotta to put too much juice in it to make it go. But it's something you can do. So the trick is finding the right molecules, which is what, like my friend uh, Cliff Kubiak does, you find the right catalyst, the right structure, so that you can plant it on a surface and make it go without putting too much in. And there's a lot of progress in this. The rate at which this gets to be better is probably four times greater than the rate at which you develop new photovoltaics. So in the end, here's the game plan for this. Number one, you start out with your carbon dioxide and water in a plant. You run it somewhere through a photovoltaic with the sun, but it's tied to the catalyst. So you've got your solar cell, in other words, here. Then you've got the peanut butter, which is the catalyst. And then you run the whole process, which generates the car, which reduces it to carbon monoxide and hydrogen using CO2. So you get rid of that, you use solar energy to do it, and you make CO and H2. And anyone who's a chemist in, in my department knows, man, 
it's Fat City. This is what you want. Because from there, then you run it into the factory straight away. Once you have CO, you have syngas. Then you turn it into a compound. Boom, there you are. You can turn it into all these products, hydrogen fuel for one. They're right, just that alone is worth it. But all these are compounds that are used for various things that are consumable, that can save energy in that. So the, the progress in this field is actually, in the last five years, has turned really serious. And, and, and he's a part of, a, of a, a major hub of a $122 million grant to work on the catalyst part, but people are trying to do this all together, right? The biology part, the catalyst part, choosing the right metal part, the photovoltaic part, and the syngas part. So this is actually a very good process. Now, for something completely different, as they say on, on, on the Monty Python. This is a Department of Energy report that I worked through for this talk. It's about 777 pages if you don't count the references. And it's actually really well written. So here's where we are on that. All right, everyone hears about superconductors. What is this all about? Why aren't we using it? Like when I was a kid, I thought by 2013 we'd have jet cars. I mean, I have to tell you, the, the future is a ripoff. You know, I was, I'm still driving the same car, and still airplanes are the same as far as I'm concerned. I'm still sitting in a little seat, but I don't get food anymore. So, so what's the deal with superconductors? Well, they've been around a while. Here's the trick. This is the Thiemann's view on superconductors in 20 seconds, maybe 25. It's the structure. Right? You have to have the right structure. You have to have the right guy sticking in the structure, and you have to cool it down. And at that cooling down, there's no more resistance. It's like with the Borg. Resistance is futile, right? So you've gotten rid of the resistance at low temperature, and it's dropped out. And this has been known for a long time. This, uh, uh, Onus discovered this at, using liquid helium, that in, in mercury, this happens. Right around, just a little bit above, you know, it's like 451 degrees below zero, so it's cold. And it goes superconducting, no resistance. If the world could be made of superconductors, boom, we'd solve a lot of problems. The problem, the, so where are we in this? Why aren't we doing it? Why are you just sitting here talking? We could be done, we could be outside, we could have some Rubios that's sponsoring this, and we'd be set. Here's the normal electrons, right? They're doing, they're happy, they're going out randomly, they're doing their electron thing, and they conduct electricity when so will to do it. But what happens is, in these structures, when life is right, and you chill them off, they do this pairing thing. And, it, and, and part of them, this is the momentum part it's called, one goes up and one goes down, and one spins one way and one spins the other way, and poof, the resistance goes away. And that's what you want. You make these things called Cooper pairs, you pair them up, and man, the resistance is gone. And so if you look at what's happened, so this is what's important for energy, what's going on. So it's gone along. The temperature at which you do this is what's important. If you have to do everything at 400 degrees below zero, forget about it. You're not going to have trains that you cool with liquid helium. Besides that, we're running out of helium. So here's time what's happened. Theory comes along around here in the 50s, and then these new one comes up, and the temperature that you have to cool it to jumps up all of a sudden, and, as, and all of these different compounds have appeared. This is important. So somewhere around 2008, these new materials start coming in where you have a shot at it. Because now you're getting up here, you know, here's the lowest cold temperature, and this is more in my world here, in Antarctica. About a minus 123, so it's it's not too too bad in terms of doing it. Living in it, it's it's not good. The other thing comes out of this, besides this, superconductors do something that's really is is really a, a good part of it. It's actually where the equations turn out to be fun. But what happens is when you when you make a superconductor, you get rid of the resistance, and that what makes it. But they have magnetic strangeness going on. What happens is when you, if you're inside of this box of a superconductor and you chill it down, the magnetic field inside of it gets shoved out and it concentrates on the surface. So it responds really strange to people around it, especially magnetic fields. And that's what's happening here with your sky is levitating because 
he's standing on a superconductor, or he's standing on a magnet, which is above a chilled down superconductor. And it's this magnetic effect that causes it to levitate. So this is another use of the superconductor. Besides not costing you any energy in a transmission, it levitates. Now this is a good thing. I'm actually on one here. I'm actually four foot 10. So this has been the progress going through time. And you can see, once you get the liquid nitrogen temperature, you can start doing things. And you're, you're getting there. And, and because you can make cables with liquid nitrogen cooling, and it's not horrible. You could actually start thinking about doing it if you crack this 77 Kelvin barrier. And it's getting close. So what's the deal? And of course, the power is a big thing for superconductors. And levitation ships and whatnot is another part of it, and all sorts of other parts of it that come with this. But you've got to crack the basic physics of this thing. And here's the problem. And the other part is this. I'm going to mention this a little quicker, a little bit sooner, a little bit later on, is if you want to do fusion, not cold fusion, but real fusion, you need superconductors to cool it to maintain the plasma. And keeping those in something like a, a, a tokamak, a, a, a breeder reactor, is a trick. So if you can crack the superconductor thing to use it in areas like this to maintain the plasma, you've gained a lot. So, and also the levitation part on trains, which people are actually starting to build, and also ships, you gain big. The problem is, the grand challenge in this DOE book is, these new superconductors, there's no mechanism. You can't do it. You can't make new materials easily because you don't know the basis of it. The fundamental physics isn't known well enough. Also, they have these things called vortices. They were, they were mathematically modeled by a guy at Yale named Onsager, and a guy you may have heard of in the 1950s came up with a physical model, a guy up in, the, in this small technical institution in Pasadena, California, a guy named Richard Feynman, came up with a model for this. And there's these vortices, there's nano ones. So you have the superconductivity, but inside the wire of this, they're 10 nanometers long, is non-superconductors. If you can control, figure these guys out and pin them, then the superconductivity becomes even better in a closed loop. So you gain. Now, and then you, here's the future of, of, of a superconductor side. But you've got to solve the basic physics before you move into the materials part and the distribution part. That's where the limit is. All right, here's some interesting factoid. My colleague, this one, that Brian Maple gave me the information for that. And, and my colleague, Ivan Schuller, in the Department of Physics, gave me this factoid. I like this. It actually turns out to be true. It's not that I don't trust my colleagues, but, but I always check. So the question is, which puts out more energy? Which uses more energy, your refrigerator or your cell phone? All right, that's easy. Your cell phone's little. Turns out it's, it, and, and your refrigerator is, man, it's big. It's got a noisy compressor, and it's pumping away. Turns out it's your cell phone. And the reason is because you use 1.5, 1.6 gigabytes a month times 12, and it takes it's the computer storage associated with it that costs you the energy, because you have to cool the computers, and it's expensive. So it's about 380 kilowatt hours per year, and a good refrigerator is something like 300. So there's savings to be made if you can make things smaller, more efficient, and cooler. But that's a barrier. In terms of the physics of doing, that's a barrier. Here's some hope. All right, so part of this is from my, our, the center on us, is that you have to worry about how does this stuff work? You really have to understand the physics at the nano level, how it works to make it go, to get into the applications and to make them respond and also to make them. So that's, that's where it's limited. Uh, so part of it is, is this giant magnetic resonance effect that, that, that my colleague is involved with. And what it is, is when you, it's, it's a way a lot of these devices work. When you put a big magnetic field on it, you get a giant resistance. And that gives you rise to new properties that can be used for smaller, more efficient materials. And that's a forefront for doing these things. But the basic physics, there's a lot that's not known in order to exploit this. Now, the second part of this is going to other materials. So this is sort of what can be expected in the future. The progress is actually, in the last 10 years, has really been remarkable. 
Another colleague, Dmitry Bazov, the chair of the Department of Physics, has done this. When you work with small nanomaterials like a graphene, you make a quasi-particle called a plasmon. What it is is a light sets up a ripple of electrons. But smaller than that is a ripple of electrons, which behaves like a quasi-particle. And you can, you can control these. So in a sense, you're packeting energy differently by not using electrons, but in fact, by using a quasi-particle called a plasmon. And so that, in terms of doing this on materials like a, a, a synthetic graphite, is really a different way of thinking about it. And this is another one that's not like the jet cars. It's got some hope. Another one is in another part. This is another colleague that I borrowed from, uh, Leonid Butov. There's another quasi-particle called a, a, um, an exciton that when you shine light on it, it emits a whole pair, which is a, which is a virtual thing between a positon and an electron, and that can carry information. You can trap these and handle them so your devices are more efficient and smaller, and you solve the cell phone problem by going to a different type of transmission of energy. When you send things across fiber optics, you send it as a photon, but then it ends up in a device, and it has to go in a circuit, and that's electrons, and that interfacing doesn't work right, and you lose time and energy doing that. So that's something else that is by using different types of particles than the garden variety ones. It's another new way of doing it. All right, homemade sun. Where are we in terms of fusion, right? That's something that's been out there a long time. So I've borrowed some things on, so breeder reactors, and, and I borrowed this from my colleague, Pat Diamond, uh, who, who is an expert in doing this. And, and he also told me to mention that one of our founding faculty here, Marshall Rosenbluth, was a leader in this. George Tynan here at UCSD in engineering is also doing a lot of work. And the progress with fusion is actually not bad. If you compare it to the, the Moore's Law, and if you compare it to the development of energy and accelerates, accelerators, if you use the critical parameter of plasma, which is you have to take the energy. This is, this is not a plasma reactor. This is actually my fingers. But if you take this, you have to confine the plasma. You can't let it leak out and get to the wall or you lose energy. You can't poison it with stuff around or you lose energy. And it has to stay there long enough. So they get a parameter out of that, which is what they're plotting here. And it gets better all the time. But the problem is, again, in the basic physics, confining it. And if you can confine it and avoid turbulence, you've got it made. And part of the problem is, is it's dealing with the plasma of how these things work, which is known a bit from astrophysics or planetary science, from Jupiter and its plasma pause, and the solar rotation is the same sort of problem. So this is something where the knowledge is getting better. It's longer term to solve this problem, right? This is not a five year away sort of thing or 10 year, but it's a solvable problem. But that's, in a sense, where the problem is. So in my last. 2.48 minutes here for these are all areas where the progress of the science is going up rapidly. They're brand new areas, new quasi-particles, plasmons, excitons, new advances in superconductor, and you can see the rate where that's going up, and in terms of the catalysis for doing the end-to-end -end sort of thing. So that's the part of it. But the whole problem, and Steve said it very nicely, and I'll, and I'll borrow a little bit, little bit from him, is doing the total part, which is taking that basic part, but at some point, then you have to get it into some sort of operational equipment, machinery, transmission, or whatever, and thirdly, get it out into the public where you can use it. So that duty cycle, if you will, is getting shorter all the time, as well as the basic science that gets to be done so that those partners are all talking to each other in, in a seamless way, whether it's going to be the development of biofuels and getting them out or, or getting the plasma physics um, in a point where you could use it or understanding how you handle these quasi-particles. It's doable. Recognizing where the boundary is, define it very well. This is the way I think of it. If you define what the problem is, what you have to solve first, then it's better rather than just randomly 
picking problems to go. I was like the superconductors. The problem is there's not a physics for the new variety that it work. It has to be solved. Boom. That's easy to say. It's hard to solve, but it's what, you know, for people like myself and my colleagues, that's what we like. It's basic science, man. That's what runs our motors. Now, I will tell you in the last 57 seconds I have here, I have actually gone one step further. You heard about the plasmons, the exotons, transmission using quasi-particles. Transmission of energy is one thing, but what you really have to do is be able to transmit in space and time. And I've been working on this. And I'll show you a picture of my early efforts in this. And what it is, the only way to solve all of this at once is transport, trans teleportation. This is a picture of my earliest effort. This is out in the Israel desert in the bottom of a cistern in Masada. So it's working. This actually is not me. This picture is coming to you live from under the ice in the South Pole where we're collecting more ice because it's working. It's, it's wait, it's getting a little fuzzy. I think the, the, the plasma screen is, is breaking down a little here. But, but you can see there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of creative things going on. There's a lot of hardcore science going on, but there's a lot of interest in getting this science applied to where it can make an energy difference in doing these things. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad I took the prerequisite course on Star Trek before I took that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to send us your questions uh, via any of the mechanisms indicated in the back of your program. Uh, we're deep into our second hour on time, thanks to our speakers. And it's my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker tonight, Professor Susan Golden. The title of her talk is, Where Do We Go From Here? Biological Energy Options. Susan is the director of the Center for Chronobiology, and she's a member of the California Center for Algae Biotechnology, and a member of Food and Fuel for the 21st Century, and a distinguished professor of molecular biology. Her research is centered on genetics and molecular biology of cyanobacteria, including regulation of photosynthesis, the mechanism and function of the circadian clock, and development of cyanobacteria as biotechnology production platforms. Let me introduce Professor Susan Golden. Thank you, Tony. So I am here uh, to tell you about our biological options and what we would call biofuels. And first of all, I should, I should say that uh, when we talk about biofuels, what we mean is that we're talking about, um, we're talking about molecules that come from recently living organisms. And the reason that I emphasize recently there is that all of the combustible fuels that we're used to using are, in fact, biological origin. So petroleum and coal are, in fact, um, organic materials that have been acted on by, uh, by uh, geological forces over um, many, many years, over geological time. But originally, they were plants and algae uh, whose uh, biomass was, in fact, transformed. And so when we talk about biofuels, we're talking about biological um, material that had recently was, came from a living organism, either the metabolites of that organism or the, the biomass. And uh, biofuels have been used by humans for, um, for millennia. Uh, both, um, we can think about burning wood, uh, burning charcoal, and burning dried dung. So these are, have been common fuels for a long time. In more modern terms, when we say biofuels, we're talking about bioalcohols, uh, biodiesel, biochar, which is the um, refuse from agriculture, which can be burned to, uh, to generate electricity, and biogas, which uh, here is shown being collected directly as methane from a cow. Uh, from, uh, so uh, we get biomass from anaerobic digestion of organic material. Uh, that anaerobic digestion does occur in a cow intestine, but it will also happen in a large bioreactor, which is perhaps a more common way uh, to collect that. Uh, so one thing that's already been emphasized is that the sun is where we get our energy from. So we can't make any energy, but we can convert it. And there's plenty of energy coming from the sun. The problem is to 
take that energy and trap it in a way that we can store it and we can use it when we need it is something that uh, we, we can't really readily do. And uh, for these combustible fuels, uh, like the ones that we've been talking about, what we need to do is we, uh, we, need to have, uh, we need to have material that is very rich in carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen bonds. That's what we have in, tr in petroleum, in coal, uh, in, uh, in wood, in charcoal, and these other materials that we've talked about. And carbon dioxide is quite, oops, keep pushing the wrong button. Uh, carbon dioxide is quite plentiful. Uh, it's uh, present in our atmosphere. And what we need to do then is to get it to combine with hydrogen so that we can make these uh, chains, these uh, polymer chains, these carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen uh, molecules. But to get hydrogen to combine with uh, carbon dioxide is not something that will happen readily. There's just not enough, not as much energy in the starting materials as in the materials that we want to get out. And what's special about plants is that plants are able to take sunlight and use that energy to provide the energy input to convince hydrogen to go together with carbon dioxide so that we can get this organic matter. And once we can get the organic matter in the form of small sugars, then a plant can convert those not only into more complex carbohydrates and proteins, but also lip lipids and hydrocarbons and some of these materials that we think of as fuels. So why is it that a plant can do this and we can't do it? Uh, one, uh, we, we were already given the image of there's plenty of sunlight. Can you imagine that we all just go out with a net and we capture what we need for a day? Well, we can't do that because what, hap what has to happen is that there has to be some intermediary that can take that sunlight energy and actually do something with it and make a chemical reaction occur. And so what a plant is very good at is that it, it can, in fact, take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, it can soak up the sun's rays and undergo chemical reactions in which it will end up storing sugars. And the way that it does that is by using a chloroplast that can carry out simultaneously two completely different kinds of reactions, but these two kinds of reactions go together then to get that conversion of sunlight energy into stored, stored chemical energy. And that is that on one hand, there are photosynthetic membranes that have pigments in them that when they absorb light, they can take electrons um, from water and do two things with them. One is by boosting them to a higher, uh, a higher energy level uh, when they absorb light. Uh, they can be trapped at a high energy level where they're quite happy to interact with carbon dioxide uh, because now they've been boosted to a higher level. The other thing is that boosted electrons can be passed down electron uh, transport chains where they're used to pump hydrogen and they can build up a capacitor by uh, getting a pH gradient across a membrane that can be used to drive the synthesis of ATP. Now, meanwhile, in another part of the chloroplast, these high energy electrons that are ready to interact with carbon dioxide, the ATP that's uh, been made uh, by, the, by the pumping of these protons, now uh, can carry out a series of, can be used to carry out a series of chemical reactions by an enzyme called Rubisco, which is the most abundant protein on Earth. It will bind carbon dioxide and, uh, and it will take that carbon dioxide and, and add it to another carbon compound so that you can start taking CO2 out of the air and storing it in a form that we can combust it later. And so fundamentally, that's what plants can do that we can't do. And essentially, all of the organic material that we have on the planet is either because uh, an organism could do this or an organism ate an organism that could do that, or it ate an organism that ate an organism that could do that. So fundamentally, all of our energy uh, that runs our planet is coming from the sun. Okay, so um, we need plants, or at least we need organisms that carry out the kind of photosynthesis that plants carry out. And we need them to take that carbon dioxide from the air, use that sunlight energy to uh, let them generate uh, various kinds of molecules that we can use it fu as fuels. And these include fats, uh, from which these long chain hydrocarbons of fatty acids are useful, um, isoprenoids and hydrocarbons, uh, various kinds of sugars, uh, polymers, and uh, so various kinds of sugars. Uh, also the biomass itself, which for example can be burned or broken down in various ways. Uh, and then also hydrogen production, which uh, many organisms, photosynthetic organisms also carry out. So when we uh, are talking about biofuels, uh, the 
we have first generation liquid biofuels which have been around for a number of years. And these are largely ethanol and biodiesel. And in both of these cases, we're taking plant material, either taking plant material that's very rich in sugar, like uh, corn, uh, sugar cane, various kinds of starchy crops, and then uh, using that sugar to feed microorganisms that will ferment it into ethanol. In the case of biodiesel, plant oils, uh, either, uh, uh, either oils that have already been used as cooking oil and are being uh, reused, or uh, taken directly from various oil-rich seed crops, uh, these fats that are present uh, in the plant oils can be transesterified so that they release these, um, these uh, uh, these uh, sorry, so they uh, release these um, fatty acid methyl esters that uh, that are then useful as biodiesel. So both of these kinds of fuels, uh, we know how to make. Uh, that technology is available, and but there are problems associated with them. And one of the big problems that's are, that uh, Dr. Mayfield already referred to is that you'll notice that everything that you see here is a, a food crop. So first of all, if we're going to use these materials to make these fuels, that means that the, that the land that they're grown on the, um, is not going to be used for food. The water that's being used to water these crops is not going to be used for food. And so we're, we're taking that land, that water, out of uh, the food supply. And uh, beyond that, with ethanol in particular, there's also another limitation that ethanol is not a fuel that can just go right into our uh, into the engines that we have that we use for our, our cars and, um, and, uh, that, and other engines that have been used to using either diesel or gasoline. So ethanol in itself is um, not very energy rich. It's just this two carbon molecule. Uh, biodiesel has a higher energy density, but it still has the problem that we're having to make a trade off between food and fuel. So when we talk about second generation biofuels, what I'll be talking about really for the rest of this talk is how do we get away from the limitations that we have with ethanol and biodiesel, uh, and how do we move on to other, either other sources of the same kinds of feedstocks or, um, or completely different kinds of molecules that we can use. Now, uh, in terms of ethanol, as I said, we have the technology. It's really, uh, that's, that's straightforward. Ethanol has been made commercially uh, and industrially for a long time. And uh, you can see that, uh, that a lot of corn in the U.S. is, in fact, planted. And uh, uh, you can see in these very dark areas here. Uh, in Brazil, sugarcane tends to be used uh, for making bioethanol. And uh, this graph then is showing in blue how the U.S. has really increased its production to the point that we've even exceeded that of Brazil, which has been doing it for quite uh, a lot longer. And a big problem here is that we can make a lot of ethanol, but we make that at the expense of our corn crop uh, going into the food supply. So uh, this is about 40% of our corn that was used to produce uh, ethanol uh, in 2012, and that's 13.2 billion gallons of ethanol. Now, what we do with that as a fuel is we can't just pump it into our, our uh, gas tank of our car. It's usually blended in the U.S. with gasoline, about 10% uh, gasoline uh, in the, per gallon of gas. Now, uh, in terms of biodiesel, this is, uh, this is a different situation. Biodiesel can go into diesel engines. It, um, and its energy density is higher than we have for ethanol. Uh, but we still have a problem with where we get that biodiesel from. Where do we get the oils and the fats that we're going to use to make the biodiesel? And we still have this problem with the trade-off with food crops. And what you can see here is um, looking at different kinds of crops and the oils that they produce that can be used to make biodiesel. And you can see that one has a much better yield per hectare than some of the others, and that is palm. So palm oil uh, came up at, uh, when, as biofuels and biodiesel started becoming more popular, uh, it became obvious that palm oil was a good way to get biodiesel. And many countries who didn't have access to other sources of diesel from petro petroleum sources were quite interested in being able to grow their own diesel. Now, uh, you, get, um, uh, you get oil from the oil palm. This is a plant th uh, that can produce for about 25 years. And uh, oil palms pr uh, uh, produce seeds that have uh, two kinds of oil. There's both a mesocarp uh, and a kernel, both of which are oil rich, and both of which are used for food 
as well as for fuel. And the main difference is uh, the level of, um, of saturation of the oils that are here and how saturated the fatty acids are in a, in a fat, in an oil, will, uh, will determine what best uses uh, it can be used for. Now, there are a number of, uh, so even though, uh, even though oil palm is quite good in terms of uh, its yield compared to a lot of other crops, there uh, are still some problems. And uh, one, one problem in particular is that if you look at where oil palm will grow, it's really in a very narrow range around the equator. So you can't just grow oil palm everywhere. And unfortunately, where you can grow it is in a very delicate part of Earth's ecosystem. And that is that this is also the band where you see uh, the majority of our tropical rainforests. And so there is a big concern that uh, a lot of countries that have been uh, growing a lot of oil palm have been doing that at the expense of some of, uh, of old uh, ancient rainforests that have, uh, have been taken down then to grow oil palm. And uh, so there's a limit to where it can be propagated, and there are even concerns about propagating it where it does grow. Now, it, uh, there are a lot of, um, of groups that are trying to improve where can we find better feedstocks that will do the same thing but with less impact on the environment and more utility uh, in terms of being applicable to a greater part of the country. And there is another plant that also produces oil, and uh, that is a plant called Jatropha. And uh, Jatropha will grow uh, in a wider range, a wider belt, than will palm oil. And Jatropha is a plant that is a small perennial shrub that uh, also makes oil-bearing seeds. It has some very good properties. It will grow on some very scruffy land. Uh, it can, uh, it's very drought resistant, so it can go a couple of years without water and still survive. And, um, but if you compare Jatropha, if you compare Jatropha to oil palm, what you see is that it's not, its yield is not as high, so it's not, uh, it's not as productive. But um, when you look at uh, why this is true, uh, there is some real opportunity here. And that is that it turns out that the Jatropha that is being grown and harvested is actually a completely undomesticated crop. In other words, there is a variety of Jatropha that has been grown and that genetic material is all that's been worked with. Now, uh, when we talk about agriculture, if you look at any of the plants that we grow, the, the corn, the wheat, uh, the soybeans, nobody is working with the first variety of that kind of plant that was first cultivated. Uh, instead, a lot of breeding has gone to try to improve the agricultural properties to, to domesticate the plant. And so there is, in fact, a big effort that's, uh, from, at a company that spun out of work at UCSD, a, a company called SG Biofuels, that has gone back to where Jatropha originated um, on, in the world and found that there are, in fact, many, many varieties. And they haven't been looked at at all. And so they found that by examining many, many varieties of Jatropha and breeding them, they can greatly improve the properties of Jatropha. They can uh, increase the yield. They can, um, they can get plants that will produce more of the seeds. There are many agricultural properties that you would want so that your plants w could be harvested easily, so that everything will bear fruit at the same time, so that it will have a growth habit that will be easier to harvest. And all of, these, all of this potential is there. And uh, what's uh, being currently harvested from Jatropha is just a fraction of what the potential is, because this is from a completely undomesticated plant. We can look forward to um, uh, more gains in the use of Jatropha. Now, uh, so we've been talking about terrest terrestrial plants and different sources of biomass that can be used for biofuels. Uh, but there's also the possibility of non-terrestrial plants. And so now I'd like to talk you, to you about um, another group of organisms, aquatic organisms, uh, that are referred to as algae, uh, that are also being worked on quite a lot at UCSD. So uh, I'm part of the California Center for Algae Biotechnology, as is Dr. Mayfield, and uh, many other people here at UCSD who are working on the organisms that I'll be telling you about here. And, uh, and just, just as technology from UCSD spun out to help form uh, SG Biofuels with Jatropha, uh, also work from UCSD uh, went into the establishment of the Sapphire 
Clear Energy, which is one of the biofuel company, algae biofuel companies that you've uh, already heard a little bit about. So the reason for interest in algae um, is, first of all, scalability, that, that, you, can, um, that you, it, you can grow a little pond, you can grow a big pond. Uh, the ability to grow uh, the organisms at different scales uh, is, is available. In terms of productivity, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of data about that, that in terms of absorbing sunlight and getting that converted into some chemical energy that you can store, they're better than land plants at that. And a very important one is sustainability. So one of the things that we really want to get away from is the idea of using plants that you could be using for food and using them for fuel. And that's one thing that I forgot to emphasize about Jotropha. One of the other interesting things about Jotropha is it's, it's not a food. And for that reason, you're not, uh, and it's not growing on agricultural land. So we really want to get away from using the same, uh, the same land, the same water that we use for agriculture. We don't want to be using that for generating our fuel. Uh, the other thing is that you can make fungible fuels. So uh, the idea of a fungible fuel is a fuel that you can use the same way that we use uh, petroleum and, uh, and uh, petroleum-based fuels right now. Uh, unlike ethanol, which has to have its own kinds of engines that can, uh, that can work well with that, uh, you can, in fact, from algae, extract uh, oil-based fuels that you're going to be able to drop right into gas tanks. Uh, algae are already grown uh, at commercial scale, at least a small commercial scale, for various kinds of products that you either eat or um, put on your face or in your hair. Uh, so uh, seaweed is the nori that you find around your sushi. And uh, many people are now drinking drinks that have uh, various kinds of, uh, of algae and cyanobacteria in them. And uh, I mentioned something about productivity, that the reason that there's so much interest in, uh, in algae is that, um, uh, that if, you look at, if you look at their growth efficiency in terms of how much biomass they put on, how much they double their biomass, how, you know, how, how much productivity do they sh do show during the course of a year, what you see is that uh, algae will, in fact, uh, grow faster and use their sunlight more efficient, efficiently. So they're able to use um, a broader spectrum of the light that uh, for photosynthesis than, uh, than land plants can. And they tend to have a, a higher efficiency of just converting once they absorb light energy, getting that converted over into chemical energy. Now, uh, I should say that these, uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever you make these calculations, though, and especially when you make calculations where you say, well, how much oil content do they have compared to uh, other kinds of plants? And if you extrapolate that into having a, great, a whole bunch of great big ponds of these, how much could you make? Algae come out looking very good. However, scaling up is not trivial. And in fact, how do you scale up? So there are uh, two basic ways that algae are grown uh, commercially, and that is either in open ponds, and uh, this has a, a lower energy input than other methods, and uh, so a lower price to set them up. But there are big challenges because these ponds can get contaminated. They're out there open to the air. Uh, there's animals walking around through them. Uh, they become contaminated, uh, and you have to be careful to protect your crop so that it doesn't get overtaken by, uh, by various kinds of predators and grazers and um, things that would infect the ponds. Uh, the other way is to have photobioreactors, so to grow uh, the algae in enclosures where they can absorb the light energy, they can get the gas exchange that they need, but they're protected because you have a pure culture in here and you aren't letting other organisms in or out. The problem, though, uh, so good thing about uh, limiting contamination, but uh, it's, it's, going, it's costlier, it's harder to get a, a very large scale and to get those organisms out where they're exposed to the sunlight. Uh, and, um, but, but there are various companies that are using both kinds of strategies, so it's not really an either or, there are pros and cons to both ways. So I've just been saying algae, and I haven't really told you what kinds of organisms I'm talking about. In fact, there is a very huge diversity of organisms uh, that are referred to as algae. And uh, in particular, when we're talking about biofuels, typically we're talking about microalgae. So macroalgae are seaweeds. Some people are, in fact, uh, trying to develop seaweeds for biofuels, largely by using their sugars uh, for fermentations that uh, can be converted to make uh, ethanol or biogas. In the case of microalgae, which just means microscopic algae, we're really uh, talking about two very completely different kinds of 
of organisms. And then even within those kinds of organisms, we're talking about a great deal of diversity. Uh, so the cyanobacteria, which produce a lot of sugars, uh, lipids, and hydrogen, and then also true microalgae, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment, uh, which produce biodiesel-type lipids uh, and also hydrogen. So the, the main characters that we're talking about here are organisms that are bacterial in nature, but are also photosynthetic and have the same type photosynthesis as plants have. So when I was telling you earlier about how the sunlight can be converted uh, to store chemical energy, cyanobacteria can, can carry out that same process that plants uh, and these algae do. Uh, in, with respect to other algae, the eukaryotic algae, uh, these are the diatoms, red algae, and green algae. And so if we, uh, if we look at what those different groups are, again, there's a great deal of diversity. This is a phylogenetic tree, which is just a, a, a way of depicting how related organisms are to one another. And uh, the diatoms, the green algae, the red algae, uh, the fact that they are spread out uh, in a, a large space over this phylogenetic tree tells you that they are very genetically distant from one another. Uh, but they are at least all related to each other and to plants, whereas cyanobacteria are off here on a branch more related to E. coli and other bacteria than they are to these other algae. Uh, so algae just means seaweed from Latin, and this refers to eukaryotic aquatic organisms. And then cyanobacteria, uh, coming from the Greek for blue because they have different pigments and they look more blue-green, are photosynthetic prokaryotic organisms, bacteria. Uh, but again, the photosynthetic process they carry out is the same. And for the purposes of biofuels, usually when you hear somebody talking about algal biofuels, it's just as likely that they're talking about these uh, cyanobacteria as that they are talking about some kind of a true alga. And, uh, and in fact, uh, when, when we show you big pictures of these pond, outdoor ponds growing algae, uh, just from looking at them, we usually couldn't tell you if that was a cyanobacterium or an alga. Uh, and, and both are being used in these large outdoor ponds. OK, uh, something about the diatoms, because all of these organisms are um, uh, that I mentioned are good potential biofuel producers. Uh, the diatoms have been of a great deal of interest largely because uh, they're very good at making neutral lipids. Neutral lipids are fats. These are triacylglycerol or TAGs. And uh, they can produce biodiesel very easily by a transesterification reaction. And these diatoms, if you put them under, uh, and here you're just seeing they have these uh, very lovely little um, uh, glass enclosures uh, for their cell walls. And if you, um, if you put them under particular nutrient conditions, you can get them to convert a lot of their uh, cellular material to these neutral lipids. And so what you're looking at here is a diatom that has just filled up with oil. And that oil is just ready to be harvested and uh, transesterified so that it can be used. Uh, also the green algae and the cyanobacteria. And uh, the cyanobacteria, also uh, greatly diverse organisms living everywhere from, uh, from deserts to oceans, and uh, also having many interesting properties that are useful for biofuels. And I'm going to skip ahead because I'm running short on time here, but I just want to show you a picture from uh, New Mexico uh, where, uh, where Sapphire Energy is putting in very big algae ponds where they are harvesting them and uh, are uh, extracting oil from the biomass, that oil then is, is so-called green crude that can be um, treated really pretty much like petroleum. And then this has, in fact, been used um, to, uh, for, uh, to be blended with jet fuel, to run cars. Uh, and this is also uh, something similar has been done by um, so the company Solozyme, which is also making algae oil. And um, with that, I'll just leave you with the idea of what the challenges are. Um, Scale is a big problem. So how do you scale up so that we can grow enough algae that we can get out oil from them? Uh, how about economic viability of the products and uh, so that it's commercially viable to raise algae? And then also economic sustainability. How do you get this going and keep it going without subsidies? And uh, I'm going to leave it at that point. And uh, then in a few minutes, uh, all of the panelists will come back and take the questions that we've gotten from the web. Thank you, Susan.
Now is the time for our uh, question period, and I'm uh, pleased to report that thanks to one of our sponsors, Rubio's, the people that ask the selected questions are going to get a Rubio's gift card. And so in just a second, we'll bring, out, bring back our uh, three speakers, and we'll have a uh, 10 or 15 minute period of questions, and then uh, we'll invite you to a reception outside. So uh, it's my pleasure to bring back our three speakers, Professor Stephen Mayfield, Professor Mark Themans, and Professor Susan Golden. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now, our first question is for Mr. Mayfield. We usually call him Professor Mayfield or Dr. Mayfield because he's earned it. Mr. Mayfield, are there any new advances in battery technology that are promising to make things like electric vehicles more comparable to oil-powered vehicles? Anything coming from UCSD? So uh, obviously battery uh, storage, storage technologies in general, are one of the things that are being funded by the Department of Energy because that's critical. Anybody who has an, uh, the latest and greatest iPhone or one of the latest computers knows that there's been fantastic advances just in the last few years. Um, some of those comes with a bit of issues. The, the lithium ion batteries tend to get hot. That happened with the airlines, but clearly the storage is much better. It's on its way, but that actually is sort of the prime research from the Department of Energy for electric cars. Terrific answer. Okay, question two. This one for Professor Themans. Why does it appear that we don't want to move forward with nuclear power? All right, so I get the easy one. <laughs> well, I'll give you the party line from the Department of Energy, and I think it's actually a, a, a wise thing, which is, if you look at the problems confronting us with the, with the other things I talked about, superconductors and, and plasmons and excitons and those sort of things, the problem with nuclear is less the technology than it is the political and economics. First, it's expensive and it takes time to do it, so that's part of it. Secondly, is the political part. We were probably more well on the way until Fukushima happened, and so that's, that slowed things down. So part of it is the political and public awareness. Last problem with, well, it's not the last problem, but another problem is just storage. You know, what do you do with it? And that's, that's always been a problem, and that needs to be solved, too. So collectively, those are the main obstacles. They're not the only ones, but they're the ones that come to my head uh, quickest. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Question for Professor Susan Golden. How long before the non-food, non-arable land biological crops become commercially viable for fuel? I, I think that we're going to see it in the marketplace in really just a few years, uh, at least on a, on a small scale. So one thing they say is nothing succeeds like success. And, uh, and we're starting to see success at least out of Sapphire Energy and some of the other companies. So the hard thing to know is how, how are the economics going to work out, and that's largely going to depend on what else is happening in the world and how uh, expensive oil is. So if we knew the price of oil, where We'd be very smart and very rich, presumably. Right. Yeah. OK, another question for Professor Mayfield. Uh, OK, if fracking is not the whole answer, which I must say you did a good job of uh, presenting for us, a very fair case, um, how are we going to go about making the price of fossil fuel more affordable for those countries that can't afford it, so for developing countries? Yeah, so I, I think there's really two parts to that answer. One is the, the price of fossil fuel, I, I think, is never going to come back down. Right? But, but I think it's supply and demand as well. So every time a new energy source or a new technology comes online, so as we increase the amount of photovoltaic and wind, and certainly as we start to introduce biofuels, that, takes, that, that adds to the supply and therefore should decrease the, the price of fossil fuels. But the second thing is that we can become much more efficient at using it universally, right? So even though the price doubles, if we only require half the amount of fuel to, to get the same job done, then in terms of dollars per job, we're okay. I, I think the most critical part, though, is going to be how do we get the price of food to either be lower or at least maintain where it is today. And again, I think we have a couple of opportunities there. One. The Green Revolution had enormous increases in yield of crops, but we didn't think then about the cost of energy. Now we do. 
So I think we need to really go back and have sort of Green Revolution 2.0, and this time look at it not just from an increase of yield, but a, but a sustainability. How do we keep those yields high at a much lower input of the fertilizers and the pesticides and the water and the energy in? And, and I think we have an opportunity to do that. I mean, I, I think, you know, the way genomic sciences are going now, I think we have a fantastic opportunity to make progress there. Great. Now, another question for Professor Themans, and I know this is hard for you, but it, I'd like you to use your imagination right now. Yeah. We're going to transport you, I think the word is to the holodeck, and I want you to pretend that you're the energy czar uh, for the next day, and not only the energy czar for the United States, but <coughs> for all the developed countries in the world who can afford to invest dollars into energy research. Okay, thanks. Where, where would you place your energy doll? Okay, thank you, Kirk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here, let, let's start out of this way. There's an expression that says, if you can't go big, go home. I turn that around and say, the way to go is small. The real frontiers in everything I spoke about, about for most of this, if not all of it, is small. And the problem with going small is, is that's where the interesting things are. It's where the forefront of the science is, but it's also the limits in almost everything we talked about. It's like this refrigerator thing. I once visited IBM and they, they took us in to see their, their state-of-the-art computer at the time. It's like three years ago. And they said the limit with where they are right now is in the cooling because it takes so much to cool a computer like a blue jean that the real cost is in doing that. We, just, we moved a cluster out of one of our buildings and moved it to a supercomputer center just, just to solve the central cooling problem. Now, and then going down to the next generation of computation, which you need for basically everything in society, whether it's big data or, or bioinformatics or, or anything like that, is you've got to get smaller. You've got to get to a, or change what you're doing with the, with the particles. And the problem is as you get smaller, it heats up. That's what that one picture was. That's the problem with your cell phone as a part of it's the heat problem. And you've got to solve that. And so under, but we don't know totally how to do that because it's understanding how things behave when they're really small so you can predict it. You just can't go out and randomly try things because at that level, you have to be able to understand the basic properties of it. The other part of it is that you have to be able to measure at that scale. How do you measure the magnetic field of a single atom? You know, these are problems that are, that are being worked on and done, but those are all part of it. The good side of it, along with understanding at the solve the energy problem, you're, getting in, you're making advancement in everything else in technology, whether it's the new computers and new communications or whatever, or nanomedicine. You're helping everything at the same time. So in terms of leveraging the money by going, you leverage the money to go small because it, it'll show up in a lot of ways, not just the energy. So I put my money there, but I reserve the right to take a mulligan. <laughs> Very good. And a final question for Professor Golden. Coming to the last part of your talk on algae, what's the biggest technological barrier right now for bringing algae biofuels into production? I think one of the really serious concerns is crop protection. And crop protection is the term that we use to mean that once you put your crop out there in this pond, how do you keep it from crashing? And crashing means that one day you have this beautiful, lush, green pond. You're going to harvest it the next day, but you come out the next day and it's all brown and dead. And that's either because things came in and ate it, or things came in and overran it, or things came in and took up all the nutrients. And uh, so that's both a biological problem and uh, an engineering problem in terms of being able to tend the ponds well enough that you can keep them from crashing. So I think that's certainly one of the big problems. Uh, as a biologist, the thing that I see as one of the biggest um, opportunities, but also one of the biggest challenges, and this is a challenge that I share with, um, uh, enjoy going after this challenge, as does Dr. Mayfield, uh, is that all of this diversity means that uh, we have all these undomesticated organisms. We want to domesticate them, but they're all different, which means that we have to figure out genetics for a bunch of organisms that nobody has developed genetic tools for. 
And so developing genetic tools for a great diversity of organisms, when we don't know which one's the right one, and there is no right one, there's going to be many, many right ones to be production strains. And that's really where CalCab is putting a lot of its efforts, both crop protection and uh, building genetic tools for these organisms. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, brings to a conclusion our first evening of three talks. Let me invite you to come back next Thursday at 6 p.m. for the next three talks in the series, which will focus on some of the climate impacts of uh, energy production and uh, our future in that department. To those of you watching uh, the stream, please come back in one week. Those of you watching the taped version, uh, let me tell you all, you're still cruising for an A in this course. So uh, keep it up, come back, and uh, the homework will be available on the web soon. So uh, those of you who are here tonight, would you please join with me uh, in thanking our speakers and uh, join us outside. Sure. Thank you. I should have done you like Piers Morgan. Thank you. I believe there should be drinks and food outside. I hope. Thank if everything went as planned. Well, sorry I didn't get you the questions ahead of time.